should be working. Cool, great. So just to introduce you a little bit and then and then talk about how the event is going to run. So I'm Beth, I'm the Artistic Director at Poplar Union, which since the 16th of March, like many other, or pretty much all other venues, has sadly been closed um, due to COVID-19. Um, but we are still very much active and we've got a lovely online programme um, of events ranging from sort of workshops and things like that through to health and well-being activities and then more creative opportunities like what we're doing today um, trying to keep in touch with our, our lovely artistic community that we miss um, and, and miss working with. So that's that's sort of us so do check out Poplar Union's website just to shamelessly plug us at the beginning uh, to see what we've got going on. Uh, we've got four incredible speakers with us today. Uh, we've got the brilliant Chuck Blue Lowry, Anna McDonald, Sam Islam and VJ Patel, um, who will all be sharing their wisdom and knowledge with you um, during the session. And we also love to welcome your questions. Normally this event happens live in our studio and is very sort of chatty and, and relaxed. So we want to try and create that vibe as much as we possibly can. Um, so we have the lovely Emily from Popular Union here moderating the chat. Um, so please do send in your questions. Um, you don't have to wait till the end, just as and when they come up while people are speaking, do send your questions through. Um, all we would ask is if you're asking a question to a specific, a specific speaker, if you just pop their name at the start, so just say like, Beth, uh, what time is it? Don't ask that question, just check the clock, um, but just pop the name at the beginning. Um, or if you're asking something that is kind of just an open thing or more of a thought or a provocation or whatever it might be, just put um, like anyone uh, at the beginning or, or something along those lines. Um, so we know that it's not for a specific person. Um, I think that is all I need to say really about us and how the event is going to run. Um, we'll try to keep to our timing, so we should be wrapping up at around four o'clock. Um, but yeah, let's let's see how we go. I will also add that this is the first sort of larger scale Zoom that Poplar Union have done, so we will all be very forgiving and and kind uh, with any tech issues that hopefully won't emerge. But I mean, who knows? This is like doing live TV, so let's see what happens. But enough from me. I am now going to hand us over to our first speaker, who is the wonderful Chuck Blue Lowry, who might also win the prize for like coolest, coolest name. Um, yes. so, yeah. so just um, just a bit of context, I guess. So uh, we got to know Chuck through um, another artist, actually, who we've worked with and is a previous panelist at Creative Social, um, Paula Barjak, who I think is here. So. Hi Paula, nice to see you. Um, and Chuck is going to be talking all about social practice at a social distance and how we keep working together. Like I was saying, like these are crazy times and it's it's hard to um, stay positive and collaborative. But Chuck is going to tell us exactly how you do that. Um, <laughs> it's like no pressure. <laughs> yeah, He's gonna fix everything. Um, but yes, yeah, so enough from me, and I will now hand over to. Great. Thank you very much. If you could just make me host as well. Marvellous. Thanks, Beth. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chuck. I'm an artist and filmmaker, and I specialise mainly in like intergenerational work um, and social practice. Um, I'm going to get some slides up, so please do let me know if you can or can't see these things. Uh, give me one second. Screen share. Okay, that should be a thing. And then that should be a thing. Can everybody see that? Marvellous. Thanks, guys. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk through some of the different projects that I've been working on during lockdown, many of which are continuations of projects that started prior 
to COVID. So we've had to adapt quite a lot to kind of keep the projects running. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm also an associate artist with Magic Me, which is the UK's leading intergenerational arts charity. So I do lots of work bringing older and younger people together. Um, but I'm also one half of Barjack Lowry, um, and Paula Barjack is somewhere within the chat today. Um, so shout outs to Paula for being fab. Um, so my practice is basically all about collaboration. It's about working with participants, working with organisations and working with other artists um, to lead workshops and make artworks that are with and about people, essentially. And then those are usually shown in public spaces, such as theatres, galleries and cinemas. And here are just some of the projects that I have worked on. Um, uh, so obviously if we break it down, basically my work is about being with people. Um, it's about meeting them, talking with them, devising, working, filming, rehearsing, and then sharing with even more people. Um, so you can see why social distance and social practice probably don't really go hand in hand and don't seem like a very obvious fit as a way of developing work. Um, so like so many artists I know, this is my representation of social distance, by the way, she's keeping good gap between her and other people on the tube. Um, and with that in mind, I realised I had to really rethink my practice ASAP if I was going to sustain myself during this period of time, uh, which I think pretty much every other artist I know has gone through that same like, ah, moment, but we seem to be finding our way, some of us now. Um, so I'm going to talk through three examples of work that I've made during lockdown um, to illustrate some of the ways that I've continued to adapt and collaborate in this time. So I'm going to start off with I Melania, which is the project that I'm making with performance artist Paula Barjack. Um, so a little bit about the project. Um, we started, this is our first kind of proper collaboration together as a new company. Um, we got some Arts Council funding. We were part of the Barbican Open Lab scheme this year. It was super exciting. We were developing a show which is all about, um, about foreignness and acceptability and the cost of belonging. So both Paula and I have foreign mothers and British fathers. So we were kind of interested in um, what makes some forms of foreignness more acceptable than others, basically. Um, anyway, so we were, it was all going really well and we we're having a great time. We we're about halfway through our project when COVID set in and we were all told we need to stay inside. So this was the week before our showcase at the Barbican and we had two weeks left of residencies that we were meant to do at Slung Low in Leeds and Battersea Arts Centre. Um, so obviously with the venue closures these weren't going to happen as planned so we decided to shift it all into a kind of online virtual space instead. Um, so here is a screenshot from one of our first workshops together. As you can see twinning is a key part of our collaboration so we would often wear complementary outfits and colours just to like get us in the zone and feel like we were connecting even at a distance um, and basically we set up zoom accounts for the first time which now feels like zoom has become my life but at first we were like trying to figure out how it would all work um, but we also put our phones on speaker and we also sent each other a load of links and we set a schedule for ourselves every day that kind of followed how we would usually work in a workshop scenario or in a residency space. So we would start with a check-in, we would do a warm-up and then set ourselves timed tasks and challenges throughout the day and also gave ourselves plenty of breaks. Um, and we basically made sure to, yeah, just kind of try and continue with our practice as we usually would, but we kind of discovered a few things along the way that had to change. Um, so this is a little example of what my screen setup would usually be like. We'd have some editing software, we'd have documents that we'd share to each other, we'd read the news every day to give us some idea of how relevant our themes still felt at this time. Um, and we would also wear some of our costume elements, like our Melania Trump wigs, um, just to kind of keep that sense of performativity going as well. Um, so we basically as well really quickly figured out that Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So thank you everyone for logging on to Zoom today because I know how exhausting it can feel sometimes. Um, but what we found is that different activities worked better in different spaces. So for example, our check-in, we would always do on the phone in the morning, because then we could just pop it on speaker, we could have our cup of tea, we could not be staring at our screens. And it just gave us a bit of separation between a check-in space and a working space, which felt quite important. Um, and it felt just a bit less intense. 
But then we would do our morning warm up. So we would send each other links for little YouTube videos to work with. And we both had done a workshop with JJ Revlon doing some voguing classes. <laughs> so most of our warm ups involved like a bit of dark walking and like loads of femme sass to just like get us in our bodies and get us moving around our rooms. Um, so that felt like a really exciting way just to kind of feel a bit physical at the beginning of the day. Um, and then we would get into our Zoom session and start making the work. And what we found as well, really, really useful, was just engaging with as much kind of online content as possible. So we did a great workshop with Bryony Kimmings, and we also watched loads of performances live on, that had been made on Zoom, just to get a little bit of um, inspiration, I guess, for how we could um, work in an interesting way during this time, and kind of push the boundaries of what was possible in this space. Um, and yeah, I mean, we were actually really surprised by how effective it was. And also for our collaboration, it felt like a truly collaborative experience because we were both figuring it out together for the first time. We were nav navigating new um, technology that we hadn't really worked with before. And it just gave us a real freedom to kind of try things out from scratch. And we got through loads of work. And by the end of the week, we showed our dramaturg what we'd done and she was like, oh my God, you've done so much. <laughs> like you've basically made your script in this time. So it just proved to us that this could be an effective way of working. Um, I then took this through into another project that I'm working on with Paula, uh, which is called Yard Youth, which started uh, with Paula leading this series of workshops for young people every Monday evening. And it was meant to be a theatre project, but obviously with the shift, we decided that film would maybe be a better output for the group, given the circumstances. So I was brought in um, and we took some of the learnings into these workshops that were running with kids aged between like 11 and 14. Um, and what I found initially really strange was meeting and facilitating group for the first time in this space in the same way that for some of us it's the first time we've met today in this space it's really hard to get a full sense of a person like in this little contained screen but it's also very exposing right because usually you meet in a neutral space like you'd meet in a theatre space or a care home or a school or just somewhere that's kind of a neutral space where everyone can enter and give as much or as little of themselves in the session. Whereas here you're beamed into people's rooms, into their lives in a much more exposing way than usual. So I think with that in mind, we were just really cautious of how to approach some of the check-ins with the young people so that they didn't feel too put on the spot or too vulnerable. Um, so we played a lot of word association games, which actually was really interesting because we would start off with something like leaf and you would find by the end of it, they started kind of bringing up things that were really present and live for them, but in a kind of abstracted way. So they might say schoolwork, stress, boredom, um, heat, like they started bringing up these kind of words and phrases, which was so, such an interesting insight into how they're feeling without putting them on the spot, basically. Um, and also what I found really fun about working with young people in this space in particular was how they just have a totally creative reaction to the technology. Like a small group of the, the um, small group of the young people had figured out how to turn their cameras upside down so that they could spin around like a washing machine on Zoom. I still haven't figured out how they've done it, but they created their own little washing machine crew and they would all kind of move around the screen. And it just gave you like loads of inspiration for how you could like push creative ideas in this space as well. Um, and then the final project I want to wrap up on because I'm probably running way over time is um, a project that I've been doing with Magic Me. Um, which I mentioned earlier, which is an intergenerational arts charity. And I was working with them on what's called their Arts and Ages programme, which essentially brings together older people who are usually in a care setting or in sheltered housing with younger people, usually in primary school age, and get them to do creative projects together. And this has run for a number of years. Um, and I was halfway through making a giant board game of Guess Who with about 20 older and younger people together when COVID hit. And so we had to think about how can we keep these two groups that are actually becoming quite isolated, connected and making creative responses together. And what we found was that the most effective way of doing it was just providing them with a whole range of options of how they could receive activities, but also how they could respond to them. 
And what I found was that not all of them would have access to the technology that we used in the two previous projects I spoke about. So we had to get a little bit creative of how we could get these messages out. So we found that printing off packs that we could send to people directly with the stamped envelope inside so they could respond that way really helped. We also sent email versions, downloadable copies, but also we did phone calls where we would talk through the activities with people. Um, eventually we got loads of mobile phones delivered to the care homes so that care staff could document projects with the older people, uh, which was a really brilliant scheme and just kind of helps keep them connected, not just with the creativity of the project, but also with friends and family in a more kind of face-to-face -face way. But equally we found having phone calls with people where you can chat through with them, talk through the activity pack and you're both looking at the same thing, still gives you a real sense of connection. And equally they could then take a phone photo, they could draw a picture, they could write something us. were just really flexible how they could it's gone a little bit blurry, that's fine. Um, yeah, and then essentially the main learnings that I found, I think my connections dropped off. Okay, I think then the main okay. learnings that I found was just that you need to have you can hear me okay, is that you need to have a little bit of flexibility, you need to know when to let go of stuff as well because you can't do your practice exactly the same way as you had before. So it's like figuring out what's really important to keep, what can you let go of, and then also thinking about what do I want to carry forward. And one thing that I found is that it's really a great way to think about connecting with quite isolated people. And those people will still be isolated after this experience, even when most of us will come through to going back to kind of social activities in a normal way. It's like, how can we keep these conversations going so that we can keep collaborating? Um, and yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I hope some of that was useful. I'm going to try and stop sharing my screen. Give me one sec. Uh, stop share. Fab. And I am now going to make Jay the host. There we go. Great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chuck. We can all imagine the, the rapturous applause that is now um, going on. Wave, wave, wave. Um, thank you. That was great. And I think, yeah, there's already so much in there that I think will be of, of use. And especially one of the things that really stuck out to me is this idea also of having, of taking these different, doing different things in different virtual spaces. So why a phone call is more appropriate than a Zoom call and a WhatsApp message is better than a phone call or whatever it might be. So um, yeah, I think that's um, definitely not what Zoom wants to hear us saying. <laughs> just use Zoom. But yes, it's um, no, it's great. And just a, a reminder as well, um, if anything there sort of struck a chord or you want to know more um, later on today, like please do be posting in the chat. Um, it can even just be like, talk more about this, please. It doesn't have to be a question. Um, cool, great. So we will now move swiftly on to our second speaker of the day, which is the brilliant Fam Islam. Um, I oh, who has now disappeared? So we'll just move on. Um, <laughs> we I first sort of uh, met Fam actually speaking on another panel for um, a brilliant author and podcaster and all-round brilliant woman, uh, a lady called Sangeeta Pilar. She's there. She's yes, there. Is here. We're representing here today. It's great. Um, so yeah, Sam is going to talk to us about um, dance uh, and, and how that has been helping them through uh, the lockdown and various other things. So I will uh, mute my mic and hand over to the brilliant Sam. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for actually asking me to be a part of this. I had major, major imposter syndrome. Um, I was reading through the list of who's going to be speaking and yeah that was it was a, it was a, a little a little bit daunting but you know Beth thanks for being persistent <laughs> but in a nice way thank you thank you yeah so um I'm they them uh that's my pronouns um and yeah I think uh, it's it's interesting uh, to hear what Chuck had to say um about the switch um yes social distance sort of switch and how we're communicating with each other now the thing is i've been working online for five years uh so i've been working 
uh, alone in my flat for five years and we've actually been using zoom for like maybe four three years um actually zoom was um at an exhibition that i was working at uh like maybe 10 nine years ago promoting promoting the software um but yeah uh it's a it's been interesting to see how people talk about zoom fatigue um and uh well actually it was it's kind of um, I, I don't know whether I, I suffer with Zoom fatigue, but um, because I'm just, I, I guess I've become so desensitized to it now, um, as well as having Instagram live. Like as soon as lockdown happened, everyone was on live and it was just so overwhelming. Um, and then also you have the, um, you're not, you're not feeling creative enough or whatever you're putting out there is not useless. It's not useful anymore uh, because somebody else is putting out better content than you. So it took a little bit of time for me to catch up with my own thoughts and stop uh, beating myself down. And I, and I saw that across the board, even people that were putting out really great content. Um, um, but uh, yeah, it's before lockdown working online, um, I was able to hook up with friends and say, Hey, after work, let's, let's go for a drink. Let's go for a dance. Um, and that was my outlet. You know, it was physical interaction is my outlet. Uh, I, I was guaranteed to have a dance like every week or every two weeks, you know? Um, then when lockdown happened, it was like, okay, right. I've got to do this. I've got to do this on my own. I've got to, I've got to have a laugh and a dance on my own somehow. Um, before I knew it, my anxiety had increased tenfold uh, because now everyone was available. Everyone was like messaging me saying, hey, fam, you want to catch up? Let's catch up. You know, these are people that I've tried to catch up with like for ages, you know, and now all of a sudden everyone's ready. And I'm like, dude, I'm still working. You know, even today I had to like, I kind of, I've snuck away from work. They don't actually know that I'm doing this. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I found, I found that quite difficult to nav navigate. Um, and, you know, I'm also a bit of a night owl as well. So I'm at, up at different hours and I've got a friend who's, uh, who's joined us here from, from New York right now. And this is my friend that, you know, we're in constant contact with each other. And, and something Chuck mentioned as well about matching outfits to feel like, you know, you're, you're connecting. And I'm, I'm connected with my friend from all, all across the the, the pond right there um, and we're both wearing like cowboy hats and doing silly dances and stuff um, what I quickly realized during this lockdown was um, my my anxiety increased um, I've got I've got like a major like de depressive uh, history I guess um, uh, I've had mental breakdowns um, and it just went up tenfold uh, during this lockdown. And somehow, even though I've got therapy, even though I've got an understanding about what meditation can be good for, how yoga can be useful, um, how chatting to somebody can be useful, none of these things were have or were uh, working um, to uh, decrease my anxiety. And uh, and doing uh, uh having my therapy sessions or speaking to friends i realized quite quickly that actually there's there's something called so somatic healing um that i didn't realize that i was doing so what i found myself doing was dancing every afternoon on instagram um like and this is not exactly you know choreographed you know i'm not i'm not i'm not um a professional or anything but you know I've got some moves um so being being able to like be on Instagram and just be this like ridiculous person just dancing my stories you know who's watching god knows um and all of a sudden I was getting messages saying hey fam you're bringing me life thanks so much for like um doing these uh, dance uh, videos oh thanks <laughs> um yeah so it, it was um it was weirdly releasing so uh i was having these anxiety attacks and when i say anxiety i mean like my body sweating i'm um actually let's talk about somatic the somatic experience um so the anxiety itself has manifested 
uh, physically where actually the skin on my arms, uh, my chest, my face starts to burn. It feels like someone's got a lighter up against my skin. So my anxiety, I might not actually feel it in my chest or my breathing. I might just start feeling it in my sweat or my, my skin burning, my neck aches. So I'm always like clicking my neck. Um, um, and then the tightness of, of breathing, uh, feeling absolutely overwhelmed, can't be in a meeting. I mean, having an anxiety attack during a, uh, a financial meeting at work is, is not, not ideal. So being able to, okay, switch off, leave the meeting and go make a cup of tea and, and have a dance was a mad release. I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. I didn't realize that that was somatic. It was part of somatic healing. It was like literal energy flicking off and that that's how my my uh, therapist was describing it um and i didn't realize that that's what i was doing so i started uh, doing a little bit more research and a friend of mine had already mentioned somatic um somatic experience somatic healing so i looked into it a little bit more and i realized that actually that's that's exactly what i've been doing i've been dancing off anxiety um and panic attacks and actually uh last uh what was it last week or just over a week ago i had a really bad episode where i ended up in hospital um because i i gave myself a fake heart attack <laughs> um, um but um the doctor the doctor couldn't understand because the doctor was like yeah but your heart is all fine your blood uh, uh your blood count is all fine everything is absolutely fine and i was like okay so this is Again, this is a part of the somatic experience where you're experiencing pain in your body um, because you're not allowing yourself to release your anxiety. You're not allowing yourself to release that stress or recognize the stress or anxiety. What has triggered that trauma to cause this uh, pa pa paralyzing anxiety, basically? Yeah. And so dancing has been a part of that and just uh finding other physical ways of navigating uh anxiety during this this lockdown because yeah i can't go out clubbing in it <laughs> um and yeah and chatting to uh chatting with my mate um uh they are auntie sugar right now uh on zoom but uh their instagram is uh mixed sugar mama so a, a miss uh and their basically with them I've, I've been able to unpack quite a lot of things as well so on instagram we like got together and started talking about um you know queer politics and and you know racial politics and our next one will be about accountability and all these sort of things are like processes and um yeah and just processing all of that anxiety and all that stress and trauma because like with the like what was happening with Black Lives Matter, that was another like spike in, in my mental health and my body. It was just, and um, uh, sugar can, can vouch for that. It's like, you know, it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a somatic experience really, like seeing, seeing what's ha happening in, in the news and how people are talking about it. Some people are rejecting Black Lives Matter. And that's just you know, spiked a lot of uh, anxiety and stuff friendships have been lost and yeah so there's a lot of grief uh, yeah anyways i think uh i think i've chatted enough about stress and panic and anxiety <laughs> that's great thanks so much fam that's that's really great and thank you for being so candid as well and in, in um oh wow people are you can actually you can make a yeah, you can do a reaction down at the bottom. Oh my like god! I mean, I'll I'll just clap. Um, but thank <laughs> you. Um, and yeah, I think it's definitely something I obviously doing. Um, what I do at Pop Union, like we we work very closely with a lot of artists, whether they're theatre makers or filmmakers or dancers, and and it is this thing around like it's quite unnatural for people, generally like pretty across the board in creative industries. It's in us usually to be moving it's not always it's not a desk job it's not a nine to five and now we're just like very static and and i can um yeah i can definitely relate to that kind of impulse to to move of this sort of healing process um so yeah everyone just have a dance in your kitchen and check out uh, fam on instagram because it is like incredibly uplifting uh what <laughs> 
someone dance so so joyously um and, yeah, I mean, I, I started calling out um, people that I've been, been silent about Black Lives Matter. So I was like, you know, just doing my awesome dance moves. And then, then you see an, an amazing caption saying, your silence is violence, guys. <laughs> you know, exactly. like yeah. that, like that and share that. Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> great. Oh, well, you're getting a lot of love on, uh, on the chat as well, which is great. Um, cool. So brilliant. Well, we are, we're powering our way through these. Um, other and we have another one, an ultimate one. Uh, and our next speaker is the brilliant uh, BJ Patel, who I think BJ we met way back a couple of years ago now. Uh, Pop the Union does a what we are trying to make an annual um, festival called Mindful Mess Festival, which is a kind of an exploration of the mind and mental health, but also um, a real celebration of, of neurodiversity um and, and sort of um advocating for for a bit of um yeah change around that and how people perceive neurodiversity um so i don't want to start uh talking over vj when when uh, he is by far an expert in this field but i will hand over to him and i believe you should already be the host vj so you are good okay, thank you chuck uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm BJ, um, I'm an artist, uh, I mean that word <laughs> feels weird to say given that uh, for three months I feel like I haven't been an artist but I have still been an artist so uh, I'm a performance artist, live artist, cabaret artist, um, kind of a mixture of all three uh, and or others so I'll use the word inter interdisciplinary just you know for, for that. Um, uh, the work I make uh, is kind of around cultural identity. So I look at kind of within my own body and within my identity to find out what kind of stories I can tell. Um, so I use cult cultural identity to kind of encapsulate that. Um, for a bit of context, uh, my first show was called Pull the Trigger. Um, and it was about, um, based kind of around my dad's uh, shop, Indian Corner Shop. Um, and like my role as the son in that and working within that environment, working in kind of uh, uh, the Indian cultural context, but then adding in kind of queerness into that, adding in other elements, which kind of uh, make that kind of space a bit more complex and conversations around that more kind of complex. Uh, and uh, it's lighthearted, it's fun, it's playful, it's got its moments. Uh, but um, it was kind of like my way into exploring how my identity crosses space with kind of um, context in my life um, when I was a child and how I can kind of resonate that kind of thing. And there's stuff about uh, the Ugandan Asian expulsion, why, why Indian British Asians exist in this country, why particularly my generation um, exists, you know, in the 90s, why we're like sort of British Asian and why that's kind of a stem from the 70s and uh, Idi Amin and Uganda. Um, and then I moved on to making uh, my second show, which is called Sometimes I Leave. So uh, just uh, putting this here now that I have Asperger's, so uh, it kind of affects social communication. So things like this is very, very difficult to navigate sometimes, uh, but I'm learning my way through it very slowly. Um, so Sometimes I Leave uh, is, was a show made um, kind of stemming from my experience of having Asperger's syndrome um, and the fact that sometimes I need to leave spaces and it's fine to do that. So if I decide to go somewhere and then 10 minutes later I decide that that, that wasn't right for me, then it's okay to leave. But the anxiety fueling around also that I might need to leave and I might just tell people that I need to leave. So how do I set that up? So the whole show became this kind of mess of like thoughts, I guess. I say mess in a very kind of like light-hearted light -heart, light way because I see mess uh, as something really beautiful when it comes to neurodivergence. I think that we can be beautifully messy. Um, and I, I like to embrace that in myself. Um, it might not be th something that's shared, but that's how I see mess. So sometimes I leave as a very kind of wish wash of things that gets to a point at the end. <laughs> um, but it's, it was a really useful exercise because making that show meant that I needed to think about access needs for myself and making it. 
creating boundaries and creating space so that I could kind of um, take care while I was like revisiting things that particularly might be quite triggering or um, sometimes a bit traumatic to experience. So uh, this is why <laughs> in this talk uh, that I was going to say, I was going to talk about uh, the arts industry with access needs because uh, it took me two to two years ago. Um, I was making this show and I realized that um, my particular access needs, well, how do I convey them? For example, when I'm working with organizations and venues, I was thinking, how do I have that conversation without individually telling each person I work with that I have Asperger's and these things I struggle with and how best to support me? Because I, I truly believe that people do want to support neurodivergence a lot of the time. It's more about the, the, the way of getting from that person to the other person is the communication is really hard and quite traumatic. So, and often the labor is on the person with the neurodivergent neurodiversity. So it's very hard to kind of make, have that conversation I found personally. So what I did was I created um, an access document, which I'm going to share while I'm going to talk through it as I share it, because it makes more sense that way. Can everyone see that? Great. Uh, oh, sorry. Just gonna go to the top. Yeah, so uh, I've called this one a disability awareness document. It can also be called an access rider. And a lot of people have made these things. So I've seen quite a lot from neurodivergent colleagues and other people in the arts who have made similar things. So it seems to be a thing that people really wanna do and really wanna work out how to, to make that communication a little easier so that you can just send this to somebody and say, this is my thing. So I've broken it down with things like the little things, well, I say little things, the sub things that kind of uh, affect me in kind of day-to-day -day experiences in work contexts. Um, and so I kind of just say, this is the thing and this is how you can support me. This will be what would be great from you. So, you know, things might be um, a quiet room if I get overwhelmed. So letting an organization know before I work with them that I might get overwhelmed and I might need a bit of a breakout room or a quiet space to go to. That's just an example, but it was, there was a labor in making this, but not as much as telling each person that I work with that I have Asperger's and I need to these things. I drastically in the last two years, I've seen that just drop completely and there's so much less labor on me now. So I thought it was useful to make it. Um, and as soon as I started sending it round, it was just loads of people being like, I'm so, so thankful that you've sent this round. So much support from allies and people who are neurodivergent to be like, I've just wanted to know these things. And people that haven't really had that chat with me, um, were suddenly, you know, um, able to um, support me in a different way. Um, and the way that was coming from me, so it wasn't how they thought I should be supported, it was what support I actually need, because that was, yeah. And I think um, when I worked with you, Beth, and Poplar Union, it was very early, early days of that, this document being create, created. So I think you were one of the first people to really accommodate those spaces. Um, and I mean, I, I'm happy to share this with some people and I think Beth, if this is going somewhere, you, I'm, I'm happy for it to be kind of, cause I was at some point thinking of making it public anyway, because I'm, I'm happy to be transparent about these things. And I don't know, you know, it's just, I haven't really found the vehicle for it to be transparent yet. So one day it will be transparent. Um, and I'm happy to share it with you all now for coming here because I think if it helps somebody um, who is neurodivergent, who wants to create their own document, I think it's a resource that should be and can be shared because I've based this off another neurodivergent artist um, who has said the same and kind of it's kind of passing around and people are creating their own versions and formats for this to be shared. 
And I also think about how this could translate uh, post COVID. So now I'm thinking, so I created this document two years ago, COVID happened, all my work got canceled as everyone else did who had to work in a, in a room. And I now was then trying to think of how, what my access needs look like when working at home. <laughs> Cause it's a whole new thing now. I'm actually gonna stop sharing the screen now, but I'm happy to send this through at a later date just so I can see everyone. Um, yeah, so um, that I'm still working out because we're only three months in. I think it's still quite hard to tell, to like, um, like uh, Fam was saying just now about Zoom fatigue and maybe not experiencing it. I'm not sure if I experience it or not yet. I don't know if it's the right thing to say that that's it, but it might be. I think as time goes on, I'll know what the main triggering points are, but I think it's very hard and it takes time to like look within yourself and find out what triggers anxiety sometimes. So I think I'm just sitting with that for a bit other than forcing it. Um, but it, I'm working on making a kind of like COVID edition, which I can maybe send to people who are, who I work with on zoom and to kind of just other colleagues and also neurodivergent artists and people that I'm in circles with so that I can share this document and say, I've made a COVID edition. Would that be useful to you? So I've had people having chats with me on like social media and emails just to be like, I really want to create this document. Um, funnily enough, well, not funnily enough, <laughs> sounds really awful. So no, uh, with um, as COVID's happened, I've had more emails from people really wanting to create a document like this. And that just reflects what kind of time we're living in right now with, in terms of mental health and in terms of supporting neurodivergence and people who feel isolated and lonely. Like I want to be there for those people. So. I was like, as much time as I possibly can like dedicate to supporting people making those things, you know, I'm still working on it. But I think it's something that, you know, like I say, as this document moves on, I really think that it's gonna um, kind of spiral out so that people will support more people and groups of people will support more people. I really think that it's something that will kind of develop and more people be aware of it more people will create their own. Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking about what access needs look like um, after COVID really. And, you know, during this time and after. So I'm like, do I have to make one after as well? Do I make a third edition, post COVID edition of the access document? Maybe I do, maybe I don't need to. Maybe I go back to the old one, but now I'm thinking maybe things won't ever go back to how they were. So I might have to have a new one. So it's, it, it's very much following my life and I'm glad it's with me. It's got its own embodiment. You know, it's, it's, a, it's very much a thing that I hold close to me. So it follows every kind of bit in my life and, you know, nothing more, <laughs> more important than uh, creating one for a pandemic when you're trying to support yourself and work and yeah, look after yourself. So I think it's very much self-care 101 for me um amongst netflix and amongst ice cream and amongst other things but um yeah um and just on that as well um at the moment i'm currently on the Na the national freelance task force which i'm not sure if everyone in this room is aware of um it's um a task force set up uh by fuel theater and it's got a hundred and I think it's 138 venues supporting a freelancer each uh, to be part of it. And the freelancers have complete autonomy over that task force. We're all leading this thing, which is very, very scary, very, very nerve wracking. Um, but we are trying to make changes and lobby for better conditions for freelancers after this pandemic. Um, and as much as we possibly can, we're just like, fighting for better change. And I've just started um, a conversation with another neurodivergent uh, freelancer on the task force about creating um, uh, better changes and um, better conditions for uh, freelancers, neurodivergent freelancers in arts organizations and venues, hoping that 
access conditions will just be put in place, you know, and, and, and where that leads. So we're just very, very early days. We literally started it yesterday, so I don't have a lot to talk about on that. Um, but if you follow me on Twitter, there's a whole post about it, which has a lot more information. So my Twitter, I can put, I can put that in the chat as well, if anyone wants to check it out. Um, it's, yeah, it gives you a little bit more information about what we're doing and where we might be going. So there's going to be loads of developments on that. And um, we're really hoping to connect with as many neurodivergent freelancers as possible to gather information because I always think stronger together. I think it's really, really important to reach out to everyone and let everyone else have their say. And that the conditions are set by the neurodivergent freelancers because we're the ones that will be working in those spaces. So I think it's really, really important uh, to um, fight for better change. I think that might be a good line to like, leave it on, fight for better change <laughs> in all of us. That's great. <laughs> Thanks so much, BJ. Big uh, virtual round of applause for you. And then um, uh, a host, do I need to make oh, Yeah, if you pop it over to Anna, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> I love, Sankita's just put in the thread, claps, <laughs> which might be a new way to applause anyway. Just thank yell you. the word claps. And thank you everyone else that claps. That's really, really good. <laughs> uh, that was great. Thanks, VG. And yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting and it's a, always an ongoing conversation around access. And for us as a venue, it's, it's striking that balance between um, kind of what VG was saying around like, you want to learn from the neurodiverse artists and collaborators that you work with, but you also don't want to put all of that work on them as if it's their, their issue to sort mm. out and that there's a real responsibility for venues to be educating themselves. Um, yeah, I think, like, uh, yeah, I think it's really important that it's not all, the labor can't be on the people who are experiencing that thing. It really needs to be like accommodated. But exactly. a place where you can fight for change like the task force is one of them. It's now a vehicle. I'm like, right, let's do this. Time is now. We need, yeah. to, we need to we need to support this now. And uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we, I mean, I can speak from firsthand experience of of working with BJ and another artist. There's a, a brilliant artist that I know BJ's collaborated with um, called Daniel Oliver, who is is well worth checking out as well. Um, and yeah, we've we've learned huge amounts through collaborating with you. So there's also that of, of, and it's the same almost, we could be talking about Black Lives Matter with this, like you have to take that responsibility to educate yourselves and, and not just rely on the people it affects, but that will only happen through, you know, diverse programming, making sure that those people are in the room and, and being seen and represented. Um, but speaking of which, and speaking of access, it was actually, uh, a question that our next speaker um, put to us at our last creative social, which was around venues um, working with uh, young refugees or, or sort of vulnerable groups. Um, and it was such a brilliant question that uh, Anna ended up being invited to speak on the panel <laughs> because I thought this, this lady shouldn't be in the audience. She should be up here chatting. Um, so I, I won't go on for too long again, but um, just to introduce Anna McDonald from uh, Play for Progress, who are an incredible um, organization that we've had the absolute privilege of working with um, at Pop the Union and continue to collaborate with. Um, but Anna can tell you more about herself. And um, yeah, so I will hand over to our final speaker. Do keep your questions coming in and your, uh, and your comments and support for our speakers, which is lovely. Um, but yeah, over to Anna. Anna, you are muted. It wouldn't be a Zoom unless someone started talking with their microphone off. You always won. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for giving us that joy of being able to go, oh, Anna, your microphone isn't on. <laughs> I will now hand over to Anna. <laughs> Thank you. I've already um, had a quick chat with the other speakers to say that if I go too Scottish at any point, feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, I've been talking a lot to people at home today, so it might be, it might be, the forces will be strong today. 
Um, so as Beth said, I co-founded Play for Progress, which is an organisation which works with unaccompanied refugee children, so young people that arrive in the country who are under 18 and they are alone. Um, and this is obviously an incredibly isolated group. And one of the, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today, um, art in isolation. And so this group aren't just on their own, they're often working in their second or third language. Um, there's sometimes huge cultural barriers to overcome and often they are fleeing or the, the series of events happened to cause them to leave where they're going and journey to the UK has left them quite traumatised. Um, and before COVID, nobody was discussing isolation. And now everybody has missed family or missed an important event or, or plans have gone awry. So it's now at the front of everyone's mind. Um, and in the past three months, um, as COVID has kind of swept the globe, it's been really interesting to see how people have reached out to the arts to anchor them. So whether your poison is comedy or writing or music or visual arts or dance, um, people have really been seeking solace in the arts. And I mean, we shouldn't be surprised by this. This is, people have been doing this since day dot. You know, we, we have seen that humanity has always um, creatively expressed how they're feeling and uh, for want of a better word, word the arts is a great tool and I know that's a horrible word and it doesn't encompass and it's shoehorning in and it doesn't talk about what that really means but the arts is, is a great is a great tool for communication and expression expressing how you're feeling and um, the fact that it's non-verbal, it's a brilliant non-verbal form of communication, which if you're walking into a room with 10 teenagers, teenagers not being the most talkative group anyway, but if you're walking into a room with 10 teenagers who all speak a different language, um, non-verbal communication is vital. And it also, you don't have to have a big conscious journey, you know, a big process to make art. You can just do it for fun. And it takes the pressure off. It takes the pressure off words because words are clumsy and they don't, they don't really manage to communicate what you're feeling. Otherwise, with the arts, you can be properly emotive. You can be angry through music. You can feel guilt through a picture, you know, or you can just have unadulterated joy, escapism, creativeness for, for just for fun. Um, and that's something else that's been really interesting to watch over this COVID time is um, people virtually reaching out to sing together and dance together and write together and try and learn that song that their dad used to sing or go back to the dancing that they used to do when they were a kid because but you're so right fam when you were talking about that just that joy of like getting it out um, or pick up an instrument you've not played since high school because you remember the fun it was with friends um, and, and Play for Progress has moved online as well. Any time that we would have a physical class, so if we have a class on a Tuesday, a Thursday and a Friday, we have online offerings. So two of these are public facing and one of them is just for the Play for Progress community. Um, and the reason that we made two of them public is because you know, we also want to support the community that has supported us and we want to share what we're learning. And the reason we have one that is private is also just to support more of the, the young people and keep it entirely young people focused. Um, and continuing this work during the time, because as Beth said, you know, everything has stopped, but it's so important to keep platforming what we're doing to value the arts. Now, and I mean that financially, and now is probably a pertinent time to say that um, Play for Progress pays all of its staff. That is one of our founding principles. Everyone's got to eat, everyone's got to pay rent. Um, but also to value it and recognise the contribution that the arts makes to wellness, the holistic contribution it, it um, makes. And everything that Play for Progress does is therapeutically grounded. You know, we're, we're very clear on that. But for me, when, this, when we decided that this was our way forward, that was a real learning point. Um, my background is medical. I was an accident and emergency doctor for years. So 
to think of wellness in a non-clinical manner was a really steep learning curve for me. I had to do a lot of reading. Um, but wellness through community, wellness through trust and communication, wellness through building relationships, which is the complete opposite of isolation. And I think this has been massively highlighted again during this COVID pandemic, but Play for Progress has been using the arts to break down isolation since we started. That's been our founding principle. So we initially started with one music class on a Friday night. So you would get the young people coming in. We work at the Refugee Council's children's section. So that's sort of our feeder organisation. So we're in a space they already know. We make it very open and friendly. We always make sure the door is clear. We are very careful to have um, a quiet space, Fiji. That's something that, that we learned quite early on. A lot of these kids sometimes just need to stand back or sit down or sometimes they just come and sleep. Um, and I don't think our chat is that bad. So uh, sometimes that space is, oh, maybe it is, sometimes that space is just needed. And what they're doing is they're meeting a couple of tutors. They're meeting some young people who are going through the same thing and they're just building community, creating trust, taking the opportunity to talk to us about other things, about their age assessment, about their immigration case, about their housing, about college. And then maybe they hear that we do a class on a Thursday night, our recording, arranging and writing class, um, where you can bring music from home and you can share it and it can be seen by the people that you are with and by your current community. And then they record it and they add in, forgive this, some contemporary beats in it, in this accent, it just doesn't work. And suddenly what we're doing is combining memories, who you are fundamentally with where you are now to create your new identity. So you can move forward with that, with an understanding of who you are and where you've come from and feel seen, which is so important. Um, and, and then maybe they go to our creative arts therapy class, which is run by drama therapists. And exactly as you said, fam, it's all about, and I think Chuck, you said as well, it's about getting back into your body. Um, a lot of the work around trauma shows that you're really disconnected from your body. So it's about mindfulness. And we have a lot of guest artists that come to that. And that's just another way to build our community out, to break down misconceptions about this group outside of our immediate community, share the message. And from there, one of these young people might be identified as someone that needs some more one-to-one -one therapy. So they go to our one-to-one -one therapy group. Or maybe they're struggling at college, so they go to our education department. Or maybe they're taking this opportunity to talk to us about their age assessment case or their immigration case, and they need help, they need someone to go to their psychiatric appointment with them. And suddenly the lines between what is art and what is community and what is community and what is art are blurred. And that's also reducing isolation. Um, and the advocacy influence things really interesting because you need to build the community and the trust to get to the place where the kids will bring these things to you, these things that fall between the cracks. And this is where the, the external community and the bigger organisations come in. Very much, VJ, like what you were talking about with your um, document and being aware of where the responsibility lies. So you can take that to these organisations, these bigger organisations, and if they adopt it, if they set that precedent, then it makes it much easier to filter that down. And that is for things like accessibility, but also for political stances as well. It's really interesting. Um, and as, as the kind of global community, one of the other things about COVID is I think it has allowed us to pause and have a look around and start looking at what needs to be done. Um, and as the, the global community is doing that, and we saw these bigger organisations putting their exhibitions and their collections online as a reaction to the need for that in the community. We're also looking to the smaller institutions, at, and I use institutions just to mean sort of art centres and community centres, um, like Poplar Union, um, who are going to get an honourable mention here, um, because Poplar Union for Play for Progress have gone above and beyond. They are constantly um, offering us ticket opportunities, space, workshop opportunities. They even had one of our young people um, work at their cafe for work experience, which, you know, for him, he's got a new skill, he's now got a reference, he's widened his community, 
and he's got something he can put in his CV if he's ever applying for a job. And, and that's, he wouldn't get that unless he was integrated into the community. That's, that is definitely art building community building art. Um, so I think art in isolation is a bit of a misnomer because as soon as you hum a tune, as soon as you pick up a paintbrush, as soon as you sit to read or write, you're connecting and you're sharing and you're learning from others, from what's gone before or what is around you. Um, and even if you do feel alone in that moment, look, humanity is there. The, if you're learning a tune or if you're, if you're reading a book, you, you can feel the presence. And I mean, it has been there since again, since day dot. So no surprise um, that every time we're doing that, we are creating, we are collaborating, we are sharing and we are learning. Um, so although this was called Art in Isolation, actually, I think art builds community and community builds art and art builds community, and community builds art, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and I'm going to finish um, just by saying thanks to Beth and Popular Union for organising this. It's been brilliant, and I have so enjoyed listening to um, what everyone else has, has been talking about, and there's so much overlap as well. It's amazing. Um, I'm going to try and share a video. Now, this wasn't overly successful earlier, so I'm just going to play a wee bit of it. But the reason I want to share it is because it brings together everything that um, I was just sort of mentioning. It's, this exhibition is currently still on at the Croydon um, Clock Tower, who you know, are a local um, arts organisation for Play for Progress in Croydon, who are incredibly supportive. Um, the mural is done in collaboration with Atoma Art. The block painting was done in our cat classes with um, Dima Karut, who's a Syrian artist. Um, the, the photography is by Emma Brown, who um, Took, them, took these photographs as a series of anonymous portraits at, at our residential. At the music, which you may or may not be able to hear, is from our raw class. And um, the, there's some other bits of art which are the public's reaction to the exhibition. I will also put the link to this um, in the chat so you can see it properly, but just, just so you get a taster. Let me try and do this. I've got to go into advanced, which, you know, anyone that knows me knows that that's tricky okay here we go oh, let's see if this works <laughs> I'm just going to jump forward so you see the end. So I'll pop the link in the um, chat so you can have a proper look. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Anna. Another huge round of applause um, and claps. Uh, that was really, really great. And um, yeah, it really speaks to a lot of the work and the conversations we have around, like you say, people often ask us, like if, when we say, you know, oh, Pop Union, we're an arts and community space or we're a community arts space. And people say, oh, like, so wh what's your arts program and what's your community program? And it's like, well, you can kind of draw very like blurry lines between them, but really the two are always informing the other. Um, yeah, and, and I, I don't know that you can call something, an, like I feel like that community element should just be inherent in the idea of an art space. It, it is for a community. Um, that's sort of what all, all art spaces should be. Um, 
but yeah that was that was great and thank you for being so kind about us as well it's um yeah it's the pleasure is ours um but yeah well i mean so that they that was all of our speakers um we now have the sort of open floor just to check is everyone still hearing and seeing okay because emily who is sort of moderating is saying she's having some problems okay i think it's just emily so i'm just gonna let her know uh but yeah so we welcome questions um a few people have been sort of commenting bits and pieces but also not just from our, our audience here and thank you to everyone for sort of um sticking with us and and it's lovely to have so many of you still here um but even amongst panelists if anyone has any points or anything they want to raise for each other um now is the time and we can we can do it sort of very officially through the chat or given like we've got quite manageable numbers so if anyone does just want to unmute and, and ask a question uh, verbally they are more than welcome to um, so yeah now's the time i had a question for chuck about the the giant guess who is that is that going to be uh, available to the public at any point um, so yeah, the the giant guess who sadly is on pause at the moment, um, and we're not sure when we'll be able to get back on it. But all of the participants who are involved in it are now making a video art piece which uses some of the layering. Basically, they did like lots of series of layers of portraits. So we did loads of different like backdrops of like different like marbling techniques. We took photographs. We collaged with each member of the group their face became part of it and we were going to do a big guessing game but some of the elements of that will feature now in the film piece instead but i'm really hoping that if we can get back into care homes if we can get back into primary schools we'll be able to finish it off with everybody but yeah that's it we've kind of shifted on but they're still still involved with each other which is the really important thing <laughs> Any other questions or provocations from anyone? Uh, I mean, maybe everyone, our speakers have just solved all problems relating to arts under lockdown. So there's nothing left to explain. <laughs> we know what's happening. But yeah. I think it's really interesting um, how much so I don't I don't know about everyone else, but this pause for play for progress has meant that we can really do in these horrible corporate terms a deep dive on our governance and make sure that all of that is up to date and really start looking at the things that we've maybe done but aren't but you know now we're looking at and being like oh we could add this or that would be great or that would be great so just looking for a silver lining in um, COVID I would say that maybe that's that's one. Yeah, I agree. Even at, at Property Union, we're finding the similar thing of there's, um, I was speaking with one of our colleagues, my, our music programmer, and he was sort of saying, you know, we're potentially going to be closed possibly through till like October and remain working from home and things like that. So he was like, if your main role is programming events, you know, what, he was like, what do I do? And I said, you know, we can actually really take advantage of this time inevitably a lot of arts organizations whether you're a venue or a company you're often way understaffed over capacity everything else but now we do have that time at least to kind of reflect on things and give the time whether it's sort of yeah looking at like your governance the sort of structures you're working with just being in touch with artists that's been a really nice thing that just having that time to just either drop a, an email or a phone call to people that we've worked with just to check in how they're doing or people that should have been performing live but obviously we've had to postpone just having that time to be sustaining those relationships um has been a really huge thing and, and especially letting freelancers know like you're not on your own um we're still here we're still thinking about you um but yeah, and yeah, Cla Clara has just commented. Um, yeah, just having that time to actually focus on what projects work, how to move forward. So I think, yeah, if for all the kind of fear of, of what's going to happen to the arts industry coming out of this, um, there is some optimism that I think it's also had a 
we've kind of had a bit of a, a retreat at the moment um so sort of so hopefully we'll come back kind of fighting fighting fit um and Auntie Sugar, friend of fam, has commented asking, uh, now that more people are watching your videos, fam, do you feel a pressure uh, to post them? <laughs> now we've shamelessly plugged you through this. I hope you do. I want more. Do you know what? Yeah. That's, a, that's actually a really good question. And even though we speak nearly every single day, uh, they haven't asked me this. But yeah i mean i think maybe it's it's an unspoken already known thing between me and sugar um but yeah i think there's uh, because um so uh it, so i started looking at the way that i was dancing as dance therapy before it was just dancing i just i just danced like a flaming idiot like i'm a dance for just like really just lose it just just dance um um but I mean, I used to also dance when I came home or like, or, or if like I've got a weekend, I'm cleaning the house and I'm just, just dancing away. Um, watching dance videos. I've always loved to dance. It's just this weird thing. I mean, I, I, I've posted about it um, on my Instagram, this little story about um, part of my, I remember some of my childhood, there's some cute parts of it where you know I spent time with my siblings um, and we'd watch uh, the chart toppers They're like you know the every weekend you know or like top of the pops and like we just go mad and then there's um our, our favorite band is um who is it uh new kids on the block and um yeah for some reason my sister used to like bribe me to dance like she'd, she'd be like well you need to dance in order to get this so um or like or just be like yeah why don't you just dance so i just dance and and i have these memories of where i thought i was really great and i still feel like that sometimes um but yeah the realizing that i've been doing it as a part of therapy it was this therapeutic i like completely lose myself in it and like um, a friend of mine who's in Toronto, they've actually got a band, they're called Lal. Um, it's my shameless Bengali plug there. They're Bengali um, and uh, based in Toronto. And they were just messaging me one day. I'm just like, listen, we love, love the way that you dance. Why don't you just film yourself dancing and dance over our new track? So I did myself up. I, I danced, I filmed, and I just completely just forgot about panic attacks about all the shitty trauma all the stuff that's going on with my family all the shit that i'm feeling internally uh like there's a lot of internalized abuse that i'm inflicting on myself that, I'm, that i don't realize until after i have a panic attack um but yeah uh and then realizing that when i'm filming i'm performing i didn't realize that i was a performer so my friend mix sugar is like yeah you're a performer yeah, you're an artist or whatever. And I'm just like, no, 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 I'm not, no, no, no. Let's not put any labels on this. Um, and that allows me to just produce and that just, uh, well, I say produce, but it just allows me to just dance and film um, and shamelessly put myself up on my Instagram stories. And it's been an amazing release just to dance and have people say, hey fam, that was really, that was really fun. Or, you know, oh, it's a highlight of my day. I love watching you dance. Um, the pressure then yeah i guess there is some some bit of pressure there um but not really because i've just been doing it for myself literally just for myself it's not for anybody else it's just dancing i love the fact that people love it um and and watch it uh and then we talk about it but i've i've only just done it for myself so i do it when i really feel like okay I need to dance like okay i'm feeling really 90s today or 80s and then i just dance um and put it out there but yeah there was a there was a moment where i was like okay shit maybe i need to post this or maybe i need to do something for this but that just takes away from from the release yeah it becomes a chore i don't want it to become a chore yeah i think there's something really like there's that thing around sort of authenticity as well that would would stop i think if it's like if you're like oh god it's it's been two days since i last posted a, a video yeah, of me dancing yeah. and it's like it's the the idea of it being a therapy 
means it must not become another thing that you can feel like you can sort of fail at or, or um, yeah, not deliver on. Um, and I think the pressure to produce generally is something that I've had so many, I think most conversations I've had with, with artists that we work with since um, the lockdown began, so many of them sort of conclude with this thing around, I just feel like I, I should be making things, but I don't have to feel in any way creative or I just literally don't have the resources. I don't have the space to make yeah, something yeah. that I want or, um, or the skills to make digital art, like this whole thing around like suddenly everyone has to know how to make something for an online audience or for, you know, whatever medium you choose to use in lockdown. Banana uh, bread. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, oh, you haven't made banana bread, you failed at lockdown. Or like this whole thing of like how to do lockdown well. And it's like, there is no way of doing this. We don't need this to become like another battle no, for like things exactly. to beat ourselves up for. Um, but yeah, another another question as well, talking about coming out of lockdown um, for you, VJ, about um, do you have any advice for autistic people uh, or, or neurodivergent people um, who are nervous about coming out into the world after lockdown? Hmm. Um. Yeah, so I've got this thing. I've had uh, so basically, and sometimes I leave the show about Asperger's. I've got a bit built into that in the in the format of the show, which is a Q and A. And um, we do Q and As like live with a different audience every time. So um, during the show, and and this has come up uh, to me in the moment before, and I think my response is probably the same. Where I feel a little bit. Mm. because of the spectrum and the wide spectrum of autism and Asperger's, I, I feel kind of un strange, I don't know what the word is, about myself giving advice, like direct advice of like, because something that works for me might not work for another person, for example, and I'm uh, kind of mindful of, you know, everyone's kind of care needs and what it will look like after lockdown, like how people re-emerge. And I imagine that that will take time and it'll be different for each person, each neurodivergent, each autistic person coming out of um, lockdown. Um, but I think uh, the best kind of advice I'd probably say is just be gentle with yourself, give yourself lots and lots of time. Um, and also just to kind of, um, if you've got somebody who is also neurodivergent to talk to, that's really great um but also what other resources are out there um and i think yeah i would i would probably just say things like um uh i think just take lots of care and see what what kind of like look in within yourself and see what kind of care you need to be able to resurface again or reemerge or whatever that looks like these terms are like so different and they're so you know, they vary from person to person. I've heard like kind of new normal, like re-emerging. I've heard all these different terminologies, which means kind of getting out of this thing. And because we've never been in this situation before, I'm like, I don't even know what that looks like coming out of it, coming out into the other side. I'm like, what does the other side look like? Because I've just forgotten what life looks like. I'm just like, this is my, this is my life. I stare at walls an awful lot. Um, I don't know if anyone else does, but I caught myself doing it the other day and stopped myself. Um, I had to have this chat with myself about, look, stop, like seriously. And then I realized that's totally, that is totally normal. That is whatever normal is, that's what I do. Um, and just responding to what, what you were saying, fam, and also Beth, about these things of like producing things, content. I had this very, very strange thing. And I think Beth will really thank me for talking about this had this very kind of, um, I don't know if it's a phase, maybe it's still going. So as soon as lockdown happened, uh, I remember going to my room and thinking, hmm, I wonder if my housemates will realize if I just dress all in orange, like an orange t-shirt and orange joggers and a green hat and just lay on the kitchen floor, I wonder if anyone will realize that I'm a dropped carrot. So I was going to do it and just lay on the floor and not tell anyone and wait until someone asked me, what are you? And then I just have to just say, I'm a dropped carrot. 
but I could be waiting there ages until someone comes in the kitchen. So I didn't I decided not to do that, but um, it, it ended up, I took one photo of it and put it on lockdown and just said, wonder if anyone's noticed I'm a dropped carrot yet. Like my housemate just took a photo of me on, on, the, on the kitchen floor. And then all of a sudden there was a request for vegetables. I thought, oh, what have I started here? And it became a series. It just became me dressing up as different vegetables around my kitchen, just like getting different, you know, but different locations. And I started being adventurous with it. There was one about an aubergine which had like fallen out the fridge and it was like, did she fall or was she pushed? And it was like soap opera in the fridge. And I was like, this is all the content I'm generating right now. And it became my life. And then I realized I've got, well, I've got to do something else with my life. I can't, you know. Uh, I nearly started rebranding my website as Vegetable Artist. It was, it, it nearly took over my life, very nearly. Um, I often think it's going to resurface. Sorry, I just went off on a tangent there. No, but, I'm so glad you did. I, I didn't know if you would want me to like out this phase you went through, <laughs> but when, when Fam was talking about it, I was like, this is exactly like DJ's uh, vegetables. Food. Maybe you should be brand as VegJ. Yeah, it's someone's Patel. Oh. oh damn, they beat me to it. But um, no, 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 you did actually. I think it was you. No. <laughs> I refuse to believe this. I'm too excited that it's only come to my brain now. Vegetable as well. <laughs> uh? I think you requested a vegetable. So oh, the... without doubt. I, I'm passionate about vegetables. There's, I, there's, I wouldn't put it past me. There's so many on the list. There's like a beige collection. <laughs> We're getting a lot of love for fashionable veggie moments um, in the in the comments. Um, yeah, there was another. There's a performance artist actually called Martin O'Brien who he early on in lockdown was doing. He has a shark puppet and he he uses sharks in his work and and he's a big shark fan. And he was lip syncing with the shark puppet every day and taking requests. And I you can see these things that began really early on. And then they just quietly go. And I think it's because the people doing it are like, I can't get to the point where this is expected of me every day. Um, yeah, I, I had exactly the same thing. I did a series with my mum at the beginning of lockdown. because obviously we hadn't seen each other like most people for a really, really long time. And we both really love colour. Like I always wear colour every day. So we started setting each other like colour themes for like uh, matching outfits essentially. And then we'd like post pictures up. And at first it was like, we went through like the whole rainbow and it was great. And I had an outfit for every colour. And then we started to have to get a bit more abstract because I was like, <laughs> okay, we've done all the colours now. So then like we we're getting all these random requests through. And like the thing is at first it was really fun and we felt really connected and it was great. But then it was like when people were like, oh, what are you going to wear tomorrow? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> It's when the pressure starts piling on, on those kinds of things that initially are just a fun, yeah, we kind of took a step back, but then, yeah, eventually, maybe, all the colours and vegetables will just become like its own little series, contained, but yeah, no, it's good fun. Cool. Uh, we've got another question from Sangeeta, um, asking for all of the panellists, um, what would you like to take from your lockdown life into your normal post lockdown life? Is there anything that you've learnt uh, that's good for you or for your creative life? So anyone who wants to, to jump in. I, I think it goes back to what um, Clara was saying there, like just the, if you build everything up so you're just going so fast so you can't assess anything so you're you're getting everything done but you're only just getting it done and actually that's not the healthiest most productive most efficient way to run anything or or live life so i think it's going to be about recognizing that you don't have to fill every second and actually there needs to be some space yeah i definitely agree with that chuck were you going to yeah, i think i second what anna was saying i feel like this was the first time in a long time that i especially at the beginning where I was able to go, what kind of work do I want to make on my own terms? Because I think so often 
because we all need to pay our bills you end up like doing projects as and when they get offered to you which obviously is amazing and it's great to get those opportunities but I think sometimes in the making and hitting briefs you kind of lose what it the sense of what the kind of work you want to make and the kind of artist you want to be um so i think i've really benefited from having a bit of time just to dip into other areas of my practice um you know did a bit of life drawing i mean i haven't done that since i was like i don't know 16 but it just was so soothing to me to reconnect with things that i i just enjoy and making for the sake of making rather than because you have to hit a deadline um or you have to share it with anyone um but then also the other big learning for me is just thinking about the although i had an awareness and was thinking about working with people in isolation prior to this simply just because working with older people that comes with the territory but this has just given me so many more tools for doing that in a much more like meaningful way and yeah i want to try and keep that going um as time progresses and not lose sight of it in the joy of getting to meet people face to face because that won't be everyone's experience. Great. Um, any other questions? We don't have anything else in the chat, but if anyone wants to either say anything or ask a question. I, I can add something, I guess, to yeah. Sanjita's question. Um, I guess uh, I'm kind of, yeah, struggling between what a normal post lockdown life looks like and what it is. And I think I'm still trying to work that out in my head. Um, but similarly to uh, Chuck, I think um, this has given me some time to think about the work that I have made and the art that I you know, really wanted to produce, but also was getting lost in like touring and making a new show. And that being almost like an expectation, it's like you have to keep active, you need to write a new show, tour that one for a while, make a new one. And it's like, I felt like I was at a point just before lockdown where that was just becoming the cycle and it was nothing else. Whereas now I've, where it all stopped, I've now gone back to the drawing board and said, what kind of things do, are important to me? And some fantastic, uh, you know, opportunities arise like the task force where I'm able to try and champion neurodivergent voices and try and fight for like advocate for better ch changes and conditions which is like a big part of you know my kind of like thoughts in activism which i wasn't getting time to do because i was constantly on the road or constantly making a new show so i think um i will try and slow down try and think about different ways of working and that it doesn't always have to look the same so i think whatever that looks like and how it will present and manifest itself who knows um, but i hope that's helpful to add I was gonna second that part you mentioned the VJ about like what's what's normal. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't even know anymore. And and uh, actually, I, th I think I said this a while ago as well. I was like, uh, let's let's not go back to normal. Um, normal is what got us into this bloody mess in the first place. Um, so I I found myself uh, uh, looking at the company that I work for right now um just looking at the way that we address people or how we hire people um are, are we just perpetuating the same systems that our governments are perpetuating which is you're just a number um how do we accommodate um how do we understand you better so that actually you can work healthier and be happier at work and therefore the company is happier right um, so it's like having these conversations or being a little bit more um, mindful for just uh, just by reaching out and educating or just me like thinking about, OK, so what is it that I can bring to the table at work? Um, let's talk about gender. Let's talk about um, uh, why don't we ask people what's your preferred pronoun? You know, uh, why don't we ask people how do you prefer your name to be said or spelt? You know? um, just these small things um, and like seeing everyone switch during the lockdown, like how they're dealing with it at home, health and safety and stuff. Yeah, we talk about um, physical health and safety at work. Oh, is your chair leveled enough or is your eye line, uh, line sight uh, with your uh, monitor correct and all that sort of stuff. But you're not actually checking in with mental health, you know, 
um and that that needs to be that really needs to be like talked about a lot more and um taking days off for mental health uh reasons not make up a reason for um oh, i'm just uh, i've got a cold or I've got a headache you know actually i'm just not doing too great today i've got high anxiety i can't be on that call <laughs> um so yeah i guess that's what i've taken from this i hope we don't go back to normal um and yeah i hope that we address diversity uh well, inclusivity at workplace uh better than we are now yeah yeah for sure yeah i definitely second this idea of um there's a strangeness in like you thought what was happening before this was normal oh okay so yeah, yeah exactly sort of uh yeah that's that's interesting um yeah i think that's unless there's some uh, another a burning question but i think the idea of um the new normal it was never normal before <laughs> uh is quite a provocative and an exciting place to finish um but do anna go ahead you're on mute. <laughs> That's how we feel. This is a completely random request, but we have a young person who is really incredible musician and um, is really keen to have a G clarinet. So not a normal clarinet, because we can get, we've got loads of them, but he specifically wants a G clarinet, which is very common in Turkey. He's Kurdish. Um, so I'm just putting this out there on the off chance anybody has one, unlikely or know somebody that has one. Also unlikely, just chancing my arm, just in case. I don't, but I will keep my ear to the ground and to the air for the sweet sounds of a G clarinet um, playing. Um, great, well, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and, and listening and, and for all your brilliant uh, questions and, and um, yeah, claps and expressions of support and of course a huge 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 thank you to chuck bam vj and anna for their incredibly insightful words um so yes lots of lots of claps uh, for them i would say oh and thank you to clara for thanking us it's a huge big ball of thanks um I yeah if you want to hear more about any uh, of our speakers work um it should I believe still all be on our website but just don't hesitate to get in touch um in fact if anyone uh Chuck Pam Anna VJ if you haven't already if you want to just put like twitter handles or websites or anything in the chat please do um and we can list them so this recording will go up on YouTube and we can just put links underneath to um, all of the relevant sort of websites and social media and things like that. Um, thank you to Emily for monitoring all of your questions and um, for taking time to chat to, to, to be with us today as well. And yeah, do keep an eye on Poplar Union's website. We've got a whole array of events coming up. Um, we've got gigs every Friday night on our Instagram. We've got an incredible like dance collaboration made in the day like you watch it in the day that it was made um, on the 16th of July called Taj Collab. Um, so yeah, loads of things coming up um, and do follow us on all the social media. Blah, 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 blah. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you for being with us. And I will now end yet another Zoom meeting and have a good day. Thanks. Bye, so much. Thank you. Bye.